Hey, girlfriends, welcome to another episode of Girlfriends and Goals. We're your hosts, Miosha and Samaria. This podcast is a space where we'll talk about friendships, life goals, a little bit of pop culture, and all things womanhood. All right, so on today's episode, we are going to discuss why and how women should negotiate salaries and much more. And we have a special guest who's going to help us do that. So we definitely have a good episode in store. And if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, please make sure to leave us a five-star rating and write a review. And if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel and give this video a thumbs up. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and let our guest introduce herself. Welcome to the podcast, Lauren. Hi, uh, so I'm Lauren. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, they, them. I am a senior talent associate at Hinge Health, um, and I've been in tech recruiting for a little bit over a year. Uh, I have experienced recruiting and sourcing for talent, um, particularly in tech startups. Um, I have experience hiring across various roles that include research and development. Um, some of those include like engineering, data science and analytics, design, business operations, data engineering, business analytics, and IT and security. Uh, I transitioned from real estate to tech recruiting and talent acquisition um, at the end of 2021. So I've been in it just a little bit over a year. Um, I work currently on the people team and really focus on DEI recruiting, specifically looking for diversity candidates. Um, and I use my experience um, for real estate, particularly um, using customer service, project management, candidate and people management, uh, research and negotiation to transition into tech. Uh, I work 100% remotely and I absolutely love what I do. Very nice. nice. Well, thank you so much. And yes. well, I didn't know you um you had a real estate background actually, so that was new information for me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, we're gonna go ahead and jump right into uh the topic for today and do our segment at the end. So one of the reasons why it was important to do this episode is um obviously there is like a an earning gap or a wage gap um, between women and men. So according to the Census Bureau data from 2018, women earned 82 cents to every dollar earned by a male. And of course, there are different things that contribute to that, but the number is even less when it comes to women of color, which we all are. <laughs> so um, it was important for us to do an episode like this on the podcast. And so I want to ask you, Lauren, in your experience, how likely is it for women to negotiate? Oh, so in my experience, it hasn't always been likely that women will negotiate. Um, so prior to me transitioning into talent acquisition, I didn't negotiate much at all for my own salary or, or either other benefits for a few different reasons. Um, one of those being I didn't want to overplay my hand or ask for too much. Um, I didn't I didn't know what the salary band or the budget was for the roles that I was applying to. And I was not confident in my ability to articulate my skills during the interview process, nor was I aware of the total value I would be bringing to a company. Oh, wow. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And so do you do you think certain factors like race or education level, the level of the job that's being applied for, do those kind of play a role in why women tend not to negotiate? Yes, absolutely. Uh, they all play a role in how we show up in negotiations. Um, race, as you know, oftentimes can make us feel like we don't belong in certain spaces. Mm -hmm. um, I can say personally that I struggled with feeling like I belonged in tech. Um, part of the reason that I jumped into tech was because it was intimidating to me. Uh, and I don't like to be intimidated. Um, and so I was like, you know, rather than shy away from this, let me dive in head first and figure out what it is that I don't know so I can feel more confident and kind of help be a good gatekeeper, if you will, into tech. Um, you know, personally, I don't have a technical background, um, but that's not a requirement to be in tech. Um, I have a Bachelor of Arts degree in history. So <laughs> it couldn't be further from, from technical or you know computer um, background. I will say though, that you should be confident in bringing your diverse experiences and perspectives to a new space. Um, more employers um, are learning to value diversity and in actually integrating DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion into the fabric of the organizations. So if we've learned anything from the last few years with the great resignation, 
um, Black Lives Matter protest and more for focus on DEI, we've learned that job seekers are not so easily fooled um, when companies claim to be woke. We all belong in all of the spaces. Um, so take up space and be your authentic self. Yeah, yeah I can um, definitely relate to like kind of getting accepted right and just feeling like oh I'm just happy to be here especially earlier on in my career where it's like especially as a, a woman of color a black woman and especially going into spaces where there are a few people who look like you mm -hmm. I think there's this thing that we carry where it's like we don't want to mess it up because the fact that they were, we're even here took so much right. so something like salary or benefits we don't want to shake the table <laughs> in the words came a show absolutely we just be happy to be up in there but I wanted to ask you more specifically why do you think women struggle so we talked a little bit about race maybe class but women specifically why do you think we're more hesitant to go in and negotiate uh I would say that generally women don't negotiate because we want to get the job you know, um, oftentimes we are overlooked when in competition with men or male identifying people, um, and we would rather get our foot in the door than come across as difficult. Um, so when it comes down to you versus another candidate, if, if you feel like, oh, well, if I don't ask for much, they'll be more inclined to take me instead of, you know, candidate B. Um, so I, I definitely think that happens. I also think that uh, we often downplay our skills. Um, and competencies, I think that we um, don't really understand or know how to articulate the value that we bring to an organization. Um, a lot of people don't recognize that you're not just applying for a job, you yourself are a brand. Um, that's the importance of branding yourself, especially with resources like LinkedIn and things like that. Um, I think that if you are constantly updating your resume, things like that, it can really help you to kind of see, okay, if I'm staying current on what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis, a quarterly basis, a biannual basis or annual basis, I know exactly what contributions I've made to my organization and I can quantify that. And that is what's really important when you're looking for a job. You want to be able to go back and say, okay, over X amount of months, I was able to contribute to my organization doing X, Y, Z. And this is what it got. And this is what the company was able to take away from that. Um, I think a lot of times we just, we know our jobs and we know them so well, but we don't take the time to really hash out what is it? What am I bringing to an organization? And how does that play out for the bottom line of the company? Um, I also don't think that, we know how to um, generally understand the importance of current market data. Um, so what that means is for um, if you're looking for a job, you want to understand what the going salary is for X job, depending on the region that you live in. Um, and you want to make sure that it's current for your industry um, so that you have an idea of what to ask for before you start your interview process. Um, I think a lot of times we are kind of reactionary where we'll hear about a job, apply, and have no idea what we should be expecting in terms of salary, benefits, things of that nature. And so we're just more inclined to take whatever we get rather than really hashing it out and doing our own research beforehand. Mm -hmm. That's that's really interesting. There are a few things you said that stuck out to me, but one was uh, this idea of getting your foot in the door. So, mm -hmm. what would you say? What would you say to someone who's like, "Oh, I'll just get my foot in the door and then negotiate later," or "I'll just get my foot in the door and then you know show them based on my work ethic why I deserve a raise or a promotion"? What would you say to a person like that? Uh, I think that you should have more confidence in your abilities. Um, first off. I think a lot of times we downplay ourselves. Um, I think specifically as Black women and Black people, we, we have learned to be twice as good. Um, and a lot of times that's not even necessary. Most of the times you don't even have to know half of the information. Um, generally women specifically, we won't apply for a job if we don't feel like we're 100% um, qualified for it so think about a time when you were looking for a job and you were like mm, I don't know that doesn't seem like I can really do that job I've done it so many times and I'll be like oh well I don't have all the requirements I'm not going to apply for that one mm -hmm. historically and, and scientifically women do not apply for jobs um, as often as men um, so whereas like a man may apply for a job he's 50 percent 
uh, qualified for, we're going to be like towards that 90 to 100 percent. Like, well, I check all the boxes. So mm -hmm. now I want to apply. So I would encourage women to apply anyway. You never know. Um, a lot of times companies are looking for diverse backgrounds, um, different skill sets. They're looking for um, people who can come in and kind of freshen up the space, provide different perspectives. And a lot of times they're specifically looking for women of color, black women or women candidates in general. And so whereas they might see a male candidate and say, oh, he's qualified, but we're really looking to diversify our team. Let's hire her. We can always train her. Um, so I would encourage you to just apply anyway. You just never know. Yeah. Did that, because I, I know you said you uh, moved from real estate to uh, talent acquisition. So how did those things, like the things that you just talked about, how did they play a role in your transition? Like, did you second guess, you know, making that shift or was there something in your background where you were like, oh, I'm 90% of what they're asking for? How did that play out in your own journey? Well, for me, I kind of knew ahead of time before I applied for my job what I wanted to do. I went through a boot camp. Um, someone actually reached out to me on LinkedIn. I had never heard of the company. Um, <laughs> I think that was probably a good thing. This turned out to be a venture capital company that funded Uber in their seed round. Everybody knows who Uber is. And I had no idea that this venture capital company um, called First Round Capital was the money maker, if you will, they, they, they wrote the checks. And so they reached out to me. They said, Hey, there's a free program that you can apply for. If you get accepted, then you're in. I was like, okay, whatever. Sure. <laughs> I didn't know who they were. I'm glad I did. And I probably would have been nervous. Mm -hmm. um, but I applied and out of 500 applicants, I was like one of 33 or something like that to get accepted. Okay. The program was completely <laughs> free. Um, it was a few weeks of a cohort, it was really intensive, but it was specifically tailored towards um, people who have non-traditional tech backgrounds. And so I want to encourage people to upskill if you need to, um, to reach out, get certifications, network with people on LinkedIn. You never know what kinds of resources are out there. Um, but back to my point. Um, so <laughs> I reached out to them. I applied for the program. And then I took my experience with real estate and I said, okay, which skills are relevant? I don't need all the skills I've ever had for every single job, but which ones pertain to this? I know I want to be in in people um, on the people team. I want to be in people operations. And I think recruiting is a great way to get in. It doesn't require a whole lot of knowledge base, but I can learn a lot and I can really get my foot in the door with using the skills that I have. And so I was able to use like my negotiation skills um, very interestingly, there are very, there's quite a few parallels for um, real estate and talent acquisition. You're going to take a person through a very specific process, and then you're going to close at the end. The same thing. It's a little less high stakes. You're not buying a house, but you are going to get a job. Um, I don't necessarily have to convince a person to buy a house. I don't necessarily have to convince someone to get a job if they don't want one. It's more so about guiding them through that process, making sure that they understand what they're getting into and then helping the company close at the end. Um, and so for me, I was able to say, I don't necessarily have the background and experience of talent acquisition, but I know how processes work. I know customer service. And so this is what I'm bringing to your organization. I was able to do X, Y, Z as a realtor. And I know that given some time and a little bit of time to ramp up and a little bit of guidance, I can do really well here. Ooh, okay. girl, I don't know what you just sold me on, but I'm so <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you earlier you mentioned uh about market research and that that's one of the areas where you see where women, specifically black women, are lacking in terms of going to the negotiation table. But what are some other steps you feel that someone could take before the interview process to really set them up for success in negotiating? Yeah. So when you're applying to a role, do the research on the company before you apply. Um, reach out to people who have held this role in the past. Um, you can look on sites like Glassdoor or LinkedIn to find people who have past experience in the role that you're applying for or people who have experience at the company you're applying to. Sometimes you want to know how the company culture is or if the expectations of the job description really match what you're going to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. A lot of times they can say, oh, you're going to be doing X, Y, Z, and they got you doing A to Z, and you need <laughs> to know that. Um, 
I would say the more you know, the better prepared you can be to negotiate based on previous feedback and the current job description. Um, number two, I would say be specific when you're applying for a role. Um, we as recruiters can always tell when applicants <laughs> uh, apply to several roles without properly like curating or specifying their resume ahead of time. We call this the spray and pray. Do not do this. <laughs> People submit, you would be surprised how many times I see applications or resumes. And I'm just like, this has nothing to do with the job that they've applied for. And really, it doesn't help you at all if you're applying so broadly. So I would say really focus on what you want, highlight that, and then go for it. Um, and do not lie on your resume or embellish or, or lie about experience or your tenure. Do not do this, please. Um, it's better to say, I haven't had an opportunity to operate in this capacity, but I'm looking for an opportunity for growth. That's a great way to frame. I don't have the experience that you're asking me about, but I would love to learn how to do it. Um, a lot of times people want to put, oh, I've had 10 years of experience. Well, you've only been out of college for six. So how, <laughs> how are you going to make this happen? The math you know, ain't math make sense. The math ain't mathing. Um, so I would say, even if you have not had a capacity to work in a way that you want to, just be honest, be forthcoming about it um, and let people know that. And so they can kind of, you know, figure out where they can place you or how much training you need, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there anything else as far as a resume goes that we should prepare, uh, that we should look out for? How do we set ourselves up? I'm talking like I'm in the job market, <laughs> but how do we as Black women like set ourselves up as far as our resume goes? What are the recommendations you have for presenting a strong resume besides, of course, tailoring it to the specific job and not spraying and praying. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I would say generally make sure your resume makes sense. It doesn't have to be the prettiest format. The information is most important. Um, a lot of times applicant tracking systems can filter your resume out. Um, it hasn't been my experience that that's happened. I, I get every application that's sent in through our company, but all companies are not that way. Um, but I would say definitely take time to uh, make sure that your information is correct, that you are not listing too much information because there is a such thing as too much. Um, for example, um, do not put your address on your resume. That is an antiquated thing. We don't do that anymore. We live in a very virtual and digital world. People can find you. You don't want your information just floating out there. Um, I would say just limit it to your name. Um, if you have any credentials, if you have a title, anything that you went to school for professionally, list that information, list your email. A professional email is best. So I would always recommend that you use or create a Gmail. Gmail is literally the best one that you can use. So if you don't have one, make a Gmail account, make it professional. For example, um, my uh, Gmail is laurenmorris.peopleops. That was literally the email that I created to get the job that I wanted. I was like, it's a little bit of like, put it out in the atmosphere, like you got to <laughs> claim it. Um, but it speaks to, if somebody's looking at your resume and they want to know, what do you do? Now I know immediately I can, I can put you in with people operations because that's what your email is. So it's a little bit better. I would say just have a dedicated email for applying for jobs. Don't use your personal if you can help it. Um, I would also say to include any credentials um, that you've learned, like certifications, if you've upskilled recently, if you've gone back to school, include that information. Um, don't use any profanity. You will be surprised how many things what? I've seen where people were like, I get stuff done. And ah! I'm like, Are you serious? <laughs> Um, be professional. This is literally like the first thing we're going to see about you. So we want to make sure that it's putting the right foot forward. Um, I would also say you don't ne necessarily need to put um, references available upon request. If we need a reference, we're going to ask. Um, that that takes up space in your resume that you don't necessarily need to give up. It's very precious real estate. You want to make sure you can use as, as much as you can. Um, less is more. So bullet points are great. Paragraphs, we're not reading all of that. I literally see thousands of emails, thousands of applications and resumes per week. Mm -hmm. So if I have to look at your resume versus someone else's and yours has bullet points and theirs has paragraphs, 
I'm probably going to be able to skim yours a lot faster. I'm not going to get lost in the information. Um, if you know any type of systems, if you're a software developer or you have certain experience in certain programs, put that at the top. That way, that's something that catches our eye. We can say, oh, they have X, Y, Z, you know, experience, or they have this certification, or they understand this program. They've had two years experience in it. Now I can quickly run through your resume, and I'm more likely to read it fully and then follow up on it. Um, if you have a LinkedIn, link your LinkedIn with your resume so that way we can click into it and keep going. Um, I would also say that LinkedIn is literally like the new resume. So if you don't have a LinkedIn, create one. If you do have one and you haven't used it since you opened your account five years ago, go ahead and open it, update it, optimize it. What that means, so optimizing your LinkedIn means to use keywords that are relevant for your title or the job that you're looking for. Because we as recruiters can go into LinkedIn and search you based on those keywords in your profile. So if I'm looking for people who are software developers or data scientists, and I'm looking for, say, somebody who has experience in Python or data analytics, I want to be able to search Python, data analytics, you know, whatever the term may be, I can more easily find your LinkedIn. Um, you're able to upload a resume to your LinkedIn. That's an option. You don't necessarily have to, but it is an option. Um, but I would just say, make sure that it's more current for today's job market. A lot of people get hired without a resume. But if you do have one, make sure that it's current. Less is more. Um, and yeah, those those would be my tips for resumes. I, I do have one follow-up question on the resumes. Mm -hmm. And I guess it would just be your personal or professional opinion. So um, I know I have a unique name and it's very common for black people to have unique names, I guess that, you know, whether it's from their cultural background or Caribbean or African, or their parents just wanted something unique. Yeah. What are your thoughts on people either abbreviating or putting like a slightly different name or a shorter name than their real name on their resume? Yeah, that's a great question. So I've seen it happen both ways. I've been, I've had the, for, the good fortune of working at companies who are very accepting and they don't care what your name is. And I've mm -hmm. also worked at more conservative companies prior to my experience in tech, but who um, I had coworkers who were Hispanic and had Ricardo as their name, for example, and they weren't getting any interviews. And then they put Rick and they got all the interviews. It goes both ways. I would say um, I encourage everybody to be your authentic self, however you want to show up in the workplace, whether mm -hmm. that be your full name or if you abbreviate your name or if you go by a nickname, put something that you would like to answer to um, because that's that's our first impression of you. Um, I would also encourage you to look at the culture of the company that you're applying for. If mm -hmm. you don't feel like you can put your full self on that page, maybe that's not the company for you. Um, a lot of companies now are, as I said before, are seeing that people are really keen on what's your culture and do I, will I thrive there? Will I belong there? Um, but yeah, my personal advice would be to put your full name there. That's what your parents named you. That's what you go by. Put your name on there. <laughs> yeah, I I have a unique name. And at the time uh, when I've been looking for a job, I never thought to abbreviate or just put an initial. Uh, but I have heard of people doing that and I've seen where some people are saying, okay, well, that's kind of lying because you're a bit misre misrepresenting yourself a little bit. Uh, but then other people will acknowledge like, okay, yeah, there are certain biases in certain workplaces, but I agree. Listen, if you don't want my name, you don't want me. Exactly. <laughs> Here I, I actually have a follow-up question for resumes too. Yeah. Um, so I don't know how long ago it was uh, that I saw this, but um, is it true that using words from the the job posting on your resume will, I guess, get filtered through a system that will help you get looked at quicker or easier? I've heard this too. Um, I think there is some truth to that. I think really it's mostly on the recruiter or the person on the other side that's reviewing your application because that ultimately it, it comes down to us going through them. Um, if we see there are similarities, 
then we're going to say, okay, either this person has really copied all the words from the job description <laughs> or they have the experience because it will make sense. So I would just say, don't feel like you need to copy every single word. Maybe use some of the verbiage, but make sure that it makes sense and it's applicable for the experience that you have. Okay. But could you give us some examples or in terms of language or verbiage that we could use when interviewing? So an interviewer asks, for example, what are the expectations for the salary? So, yeah. hey, Samaria, how much do you want to make? You're like, yeah. all the money. <laughs> right. Give me all the money. Um, so a question that you might hear. So this is a question I might ask a candidate. I'll say, you know, what salary range are you targeting for your next role? Do you have a specific number in mind? Um, a great answer to that question would be, can you please share the salary range for this role in base pay and total rewards? Um, I'm more than happy to negotiate at a later time once I have a better idea of the expectations for this role and what kinds of benefits are offered. Um, that lets them know that I'm expecting not only the base pay, but other things as well, because total rewards is important. Um, but also, this doesn't necessarily put you in a corner when it comes time to negotiation. So a lot of times as a recruiter in my very first call with the candidate, I'll say, hey, this is what you can expect. A lot of companies are not so forthcoming. Um, so it's a really great way for you to, got, to get an idea of what you can expect um, and let them know, you know, as I speak to more people at the company during this interview process, I'll be able to better understand what is expected of me and what that should look like in terms of salary. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's my answer for that. Okay. okay. Uh, so another scenario, uh, if like the interviewer or recruiter says like the, the range posted on the job description or the website is non-negotiable, where do we go from there? <laughs> Yeah, so this may sound like, uh, unfortunately, the salary cannot be adjusted at this time. Are you willing to accept this salary? Uh, a great response to that would be, thanks, providing, thanks for providing clarity around the rigidity of the salary range. Are there any other concessions that you can make regarding equity, like stock options or RSUs, PTO, which could be like an additional week or a few more days, uh, whether that might be health insurance, company paid health care premiums, a sign-on bonus, annual or quarterly stipends, travel and relocation reimbursement or coverage, um, extended parental leave, work from home arrangements, 401k matching, an FSA, like a flex spending account or HSA, a health savings account or mental health days or free counseling sessions. So if you can't get them to come up on the salary, ask for everything else and see what sticks. <laughs> um, a lot of times it's not necessarily the salary this is the really telling about the culture of an organization, whether they're just willing to pay you for the work that you do when you show up or whether they're really investing in you as a person from a very holistic perspective. So if they're not able to come up on the budget and they're like, we're really fixated in this, that's OK. Sometimes that happens. Um, but what else can they provide that will make, you know, this a little bit more palatable for you until you can either get a raise or a new position? Yes, I love that. Um, one of the big differences from when I had like my first job to where I had a bit more experience was, well, one, I was right out of college. So I was just happy to have something, okay. especially when we graduated. Taking crumbs. <laughs> okay, we were just like, we got jobs. <laughs> it was a rough time back in 2011, uh, the economy. Ooh. But uh, as I got older, one of the things I realized was all the other things that you mentioned, and I could remember transitioning. It, it wasn't after my first job, but maybe the second role or third, where I was like really on before, this is before COVID times, this is a while mm -hmm. ago, but the work from home thing, because I, I need flexibility. I didn't realize how much flexibility I needed until I was restricted in like an office corporate environment, Monday through Friday, unless I took off. Now, obviously mm -hmm. times are different now, but back then, yeah, that was a must. I, I need the ability to work from home when needed. <laughs> right. And I don't feel like a lot of these things, like asking for some of these things is not asking too much. So don't feel like you can't or you need to tiptoe walk on eggshells, like ask for it. A lot of people are asking for it. I guarantee if you're not asking for it, the nine other people who apply for the job are. So ask. You never oh, yeah. know what they will say yes to. 
And I would take a slow yes over a fast no any day. So oh, yeah. Yeah. Ask I remember one of my old coworkers. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember randomly finding out that he negotiated more vacation time. I was like wondering, like, how is this guy always off? <laughs> it turns out like some kind of way he negotiated like double, triple the time. Uh, and it wasn't in the tech space where I know they can give unlimited PTO and all that. But mm -hmm. at the time, if everyone else was getting maybe four to six weeks, he was at like 12 weeks. I'm like, yeah. what happened? <laughs> he was like, oh, I, I don't want to be here. <laughs> he was like, oh, I asked up front. Yeah. Like, now I know. Yep. Oh, yeah. I, okay. I was going to last ask the last question, though. Mm -hmm. What if they just say we ain't got it? <laughs> yeah. So what that might sound like, and I've said this a lot, because sometimes you just sometimes we can't compete with other companies, um, especially, especially in tech. I mean, we're going up against huge tech companies, but it'll sound like, uh, unfortunately, that number exceeds the most that we can offer for this role at this time. Are there any additional benefits that you would be interested in? And is there anything that we can offer like equity or a sign on bonus or additional PTO, like you mentioned, um, that will make you accept the role right now? Um, a lot of times there is not a lot of wiggle room and we as recruiters are just getting the information from the top down. So a lot of times we are not the true decision makers when it comes to what we can and can't give. It really just depends on organization and where they are. Um, but yeah, if, if they're, at the top of their range, see what else they can offer. Um, if you are in a position to be offered equity, ask for more equity. That's going to definitely yield you more money over time um, mm -hmm. in ways that a salary increase can't. So I would definitely just see what you can get, even if they can't offer you more than the top of that range. Ask for everything else. Yeah. And hopefully the stock market is good. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> um, so as a recruiter, besides negotiating, what are some of the other opportunities you think people should focus on for setting themselves up for successful careers? Oh, um, that's a really good question. So I would say and know your brand, number one. Know who you are, what you're doing, where you're going. Um, you don't necessarily have to have all the details worked out, but know what you're bringing to an organization and be confident in that. Um, ask questions, ask hard questions, um, ask people, you know, why are you working here? Why do you like working here? Ask those questions to get a better idea of the company culture. Um, in terms of your career long term, I would say know what you're going for. If you need to take other certifications or courses, if you need to get more education, do that. Um, reach out for resources, network with other people. And this is my best tip for your career over time. Network when you don't need to. So what that means is before you need a job, you need to know like, five recruiters because you never know like we are seeing right now where the job market will go um last year in tech was really rough several companies big companies laid off thousands of people and so it really helps to maintain relationships with people because you never know who you're going to know and where they're going to be in six 12 months time i reached out to a lady that i found who was a resume writer on linkedin when i was down and out and looking for a job and she was nice enough to help me for free another black woman um she helped me for free and then a few months later i had a job and she didn't and she was like, hey, can you put me on a sure company? And even though I couldn't get her the job, like I referred her and she wasn't selected, she remembered that. And then mm -hmm. months later, where did she land? At Meta, at Facebook. And she was like, hey, wow. girl, I'm here. If you need me, call me. Yeah. You never know where you're going to meet people and where they're going to be. So I would say the best and most important piece of advice is to network before you need to network. Go to conferences, stay current on what's happening in your industry, Stay current. I would say create a group of, of friends who you work with or professionals, you know, go to different conferences. I went to Afrotech last year. Amazing experience, nice. but highly recommend it. Even if you're not in tech and you want to be, go anyway. Um, there literally are so many people that you can meet who can put you in rooms in positions that you probably couldn't get on your own. But literally knowing people is much more important than I would say than what you know. They can always teach you that. 
-hmm. But yeah, I would say networking is very big in terms of your career. It will literally propel you forward so much further. Yeah, I I love that, especially uh, that you met this resume writer on LinkedIn, because I think when you say networking, especially as an introvert, my mind immediately goes to, oh God, I need to be in a room with people. (laughs) And that can be just like, draining just thinking right. about it is a little bit draining right Ooh. and so uh I, I love that you're telling people to make connections and network not just in person but you know on social media or, or I, I guess LinkedIn isn't technically social media but kind of oh like, it very uh, much yeah. is okay LinkedIn yeah. is its own world now it is not what it used yeah. to be when it first came out it is I so I literally when I was looking for a job I took about four months off of social media in terms of Instagram, Facebook, all of that. I was exclusively on LinkedIn for four months and I was on there every single day networking. I didn't submit nearly as many jobs as people I reached out to and said, hey, and and with LinkedIn, you can post someone else's post for Mm -hmm. um, views. So like, say for instance, Samaria, you post something and I repost it. Now you've reached my audience as well. And so you don't necessarily have to be friends with everyone that I know, but now everyone that I know has seen your post. And so it's really important to repost things, to reach out to people, to leave comments, because that's going to hit it, it expands so very quickly when you do that. Um, LinkedIn is, the, I would say, the primary place where people are networking professionally these days, mm-hmm. especially post-COVID, quote unquote, post-COVID. Right. Um, <laughs> I've met a lot of people on LinkedIn. I've met quite a few of them on um, in at, at Afrotech last year that I met on LinkedIn. And I said, hey, I met you six months ago and it's so nice to see you in person. And we were in Texas, but I met people from across the country at that particular event and was able to make even further, you know, even more connections because I met you, you know, whenever it's, it's a, it's a very good way to make connections, to grow your network, to reach out, to see what's available and keep yourself front of mind for other people who may have an opportunity for you in the future. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's all on who, you know, yeah, I, I wanted to ask, uh, if you could share any more information about Afrotech. So I heard a lot about it on Twitter. And mm-hmm. of course, I'm not in tech. Well, I was like, oh, this sounds like a really nice social gathering. Should I be popping <laughs> up there? <laughs> not even close to tech, anything related to tech. But I was like, oh, this sounds cool. But um, yeah, so for people who are looking to break into um, tech or people who are in tech, can you just uh, share a little bit about how they should use their time at Afrotech, uh, how you use your time and the experience that you might, you know, think would be helpful. Yeah, so this was actually my first experience at Afrotech. Again, as I mentioned, I just got into tech. I hadn't really heard much about it prior to maybe like three months before my coworkers. I was I'm in the Black ERG at my company. That's an employee resource group, so we all get together and just you know mm-hmm. talk and professionally exchange information and ideas. Uh, and they were like, "Hey, who's going to Afrotech?" And I was like, "What is this?" <laughs> <laughs> and so I looked at the the website and I was like, "Oh, this looks lit! I want to go." And so I volunteered. I used part of my professional development and um, learning um, stipend at my company to pay for some of my trip, um, which they they uh, reimbursed. But I wanted to go and just learn. I, as I mentioned before, I started in tech. I don't know much about it. I'm not technically inclined, but I want to know as much as I can. And I want to know people who know the information I'm trying to get. And so I said, I'm going to put myself in this particular environment and I'm just going to absorb as much as possible. So while I was there, uh, it was actually in Austin, Texas um, in November. Um, I went and I was able to sit in different um, conversations. These are executive level professionals. These are people who have transitioned into tech. I mean, there was it's it's. It's not just a technical or professional conference. It's also like a cultural um, conference as well. So there were lots of parties, lots of music. I think Wale performed as well. Um, It's a, yeah, it was great. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, There are a lot of opportunities to put yourself in um, rooms with people who you may not otherwise come across in terms of having experience. Mark Cuban was a speaker there. As you know, he's a billionaire. Um, and he was speaking specifically about hiring diversity talent who are now running some of his companies. Um, there were um, there was an expo, three of those days, I believe, where you could go into this expo um, at the, the convention center. And they had companies 
from Silicon Valley. They had Facebook Meta, they had Google, they had Amazon, Home Depot, LinkedIn, you name it, Uber, TikTok, everybody was there, Lyft, um, Slalom. Like there were so many different companies that were represented and they all had people at their booths willing to tell you about their organizations, wanting to hire on the spot or hate a lot of information and we'll get back to you about jobs that you're interested in. And so it's a great way to network with those companies individually. If you're looking to apply to a certain company, it's a great way to get yourself in front of a recruiter face-to-face. -face. They can see you, you're a real person. You can have conversations, you can ask questions and you can follow up. Hey, I met you at Afrotech. It was really great to speak with you. Would love a follow-up conversation for 15 or 30 minutes next week. Can I put time on your calendar? Now you've made that connection in person and now you can go from there. And you never know where that recruiter would end up. As I mentioned, sometimes we move jobs and now I might be at another company and say, oh, hey, you know, I saw them at Afrotech and now I can put them on for this particular role, even though it's at a different company. So it's a really great way to network. I would say spend your time networking. They have a lot of different networking events, whether that be a coffee meetup in the morning or run or whatever the case is. If there's a party, I was networking at a party. Literally, I was like, yeah, girl, what's your LinkedIn? I'm screaming. <laughs> yeah, I got a job rec open right now. Let me go ahead and get your information because you just never know who you're going to meet and where. But it's an opportunity to just put yourself out there. Everybody is doing it. So don't feel weird about putting yourself out there. This is literally why we're here is to put mm -hmm. yourself out there, get the information that you need or learn more about a specific topic. They were talking a lot about Web3 and that's like the newest version of the internet. Like what? I don't even know what that is. Let me learn more about this. Or how can I incorporate DEI into my company's recruiting um, strategy or I mean, there was just literally everything. They created a beat on stage with Zay Tobin, the producer. He's produced Usher and a whole bunch of other people. Yes. They used wow. that as an example about how technology is literally incorporated into so many things that we don't necessarily think about. So it doesn't necessarily have to be, oh, I'm a developer and I develop websites or I'm a back-end engineer. It can literally be anything. You could be like me who have no technical experience and go in and say, hey, I'm a recruiter for this particular company. I'm looking to hire these many people, are you interested? So I would say, even if you don't have the experience, go anyway, because you never know. You might come back with a job. Uh, you just, yeah. you literally never know. Nice. Okay. I was kind of going to ask like how often people should negotiate. Like if you're in a position, like every time. Okay. <laughs> every single time. Okay. But, but like if you're in a job already and so you've been there two years and you've never negotiated. Like, would you recommend every year you need to, every year when there's like the little bump, right? You mm -hmm. need to try for more or not so frequently. I would say ask, you never know. If they say no, then you know what it is, but don't ever count yourself out of more money if you can possibly earn more. And sometimes with certain companies, you may not be able to earn more money, but you might be able to acquire more equity. If you get a raise or promotion, that might be something that you can get more of as well. But I would definitely encourage you to ask every single time. Okay, cool. All right, we're gonna transition. That was wonderful, Lauren. Thank oh, you yeah. so, Thank so you. much. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, that was excellent. And so we're, we're going to go into our next segment, which is just a this or that. And we tried to make it as HR related as possible, girl. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we'll see how this goes. Okay, so the first one, and we'll all answer, but the we'll start with you, Lauren. The first one is, would you rather have a higher pay or more schedule flexibility, like PTO, um, unlimited, but making a little bit less, which would you prefer? Flexibility all day. Okay. For okay. Me. Yeah. That's flexibility is the name of the game. <laughs> flexibility for me too. Absolutely for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay. okay. All right. So the next one is, would you prefer a diversity level with less diversity in the rest of the company or a diverse company with the all white male C level? Oh, I'm going to go for diverse sea level uh, because when it's top down, it's more likely to happen on a on a quicker timeline. Um, I would say when it's the company is more diverse and the C-suite is not so diverse, there's it's 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 a lot harder to change. Um, so, yeah, that'll be my answer. Mm. I'm conflicted. 
because I would be coming in not on the sea level maybe. And so like I would be bumping shoulder or rubbing shoulders with people who aren't like, I wonder how I would fit into the culture because I'm not working with the sea level people or if I'm not working with the sea level people, even though they're diverse, who am I working with every day and how, yeah, how would I relate to them? So I'm conflicted on this. You got to pick one. I'll go ahead and say mine. So I would <laughs> go with a diverse company. Yeah. Mm, okay. And it's not, <laughs> it's not because of necessarily who I would be working with daily. Um, I'm big on mindset. So it would just really depend, but I would still go initially with a diverse company. Oh, I, I think I'm going to go diverse company. It is about who I would work with, but also who would be like managing me, depending on what level I'm coming in on. Like, I don't know that I want my boss and then my boss's boss to not be, or to be like just white male. Cause I would wonder how they would relate. Yeah. So I, I would say diverse <laughs> company. But I'm conflicted on that one. So let's just move to the yeah. next one before I change my mind. <laughs> um, okay. So would you prefer a company that gives you an outstanding pay and benefits package, but doesn't have the best culture or a company that is lacking in the pay and benefits, but you love the culture? I'm going with culture. I, I need to love the culture. The money follows. Um, and sometimes it may not follow at that particular company, but maybe it follows at the next opportunity. But for me, my mental health is very important. And so I'm going to have to go with culture because I'm dealing, like you said, I'm dealing with you day to day. The money may not be there, but I got to keep it together to even enjoy the money. Mm. Okay. Uh, so I'm conflicted on this one, but to keep it quick, I'm going to go with the outstanding pay and benefits package. Oh, okay. But right. yeah, we'll just keep it rolling. What's yours? <laughs> okay. So <laughs> if if it's something that I've come in knowing I'm only going to be there for a certain amount of time, I will go with the, the pay. But if it's mm -hmm. something like I'm settling into my career and I want to be there for a long time, I would go with the culture. So you're supposed to pick I know one. She's gonna, I, I knew you were gonna come come for me <laughs> because I didn't choose one, but that's my answer. So next. All right. All right. So um we did an episode on black hair in the workplace. Not sure if you had a chance to listen to that one, Lauren, but the this or that, or the question is a boss makes a comment about your natural hair, which you have beautiful locks like me, by the way. Thank Do you. you document it with HR or have a conversation with the boss? Oh, for me, it's going to be both because I'm covering my bases, all of them. Um, I actually experienced some discrimination in the workplace when I first started my locks. I wasn't in tech. I was in the law firm and it was very conservative, very not black woman. Um, and so um, quite the opposite of that. Uh, and people were always commenting, oh, what are you doing with your hair? And I was like, it's doing what it's doing. And yeah, I had been working there for some time and it wasn't necessarily my superiors asking these questions. It was more like my coworkers. Mm -hmm. um, and so I I would recommend that you document it and also have a, a conversation. Um, I think it's important to cover your basis because if you need to at any particular point in time sue or have some type of discrimination um, situation going on, you want to make sure that you're covering yourself. Okay, Uh my quick answer is have a conversation with the boss. Ooh, okay. I'm only going to pick one. I'm really trying to hold myself to picking one. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, if I had to pick one, I would probably go with HR just because of what society is doing right now as far as mm -hmm. hair goes. So I would definitely want that to be um, to be documented. But um, yeah, so since we're at time, we'll go ahead and conclude the episode there. But thank you so much, Lauren, for coming. This was so amazing. And I know it's an episode that I'll probably return to a lot because even though I'm not in tech, um, I'm nearing the end of my program and I will probably be negotiating things, you know, uh, sooner rather than later. So thank you for giving us so much knowledge. Um, and speaking Absolutely. 
Thank you for having me. Um, when you asked me, I was like, me, little old me, you want me to be on your podcast? I was so excited. Um, something that you all didn't know is that I, I was like, by the time I'm 40, I want to be on a TED Talk. And I was like, this is my first step towards my TED Talk. I was so excited. And then I was nervous. And so um, I just wanted to say thank you for having me. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you need to individually. Um, for any other questions regarding tech, career, recruiting, all of those things, I'm very happy to help. Uh, part of the reason that I did this is because I wanted to help be a good gatekeeper, as I mentioned. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Of course, of course. And uh, to our audience, thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode of the Girlfriends and Goals podcast. Make sure you follow us on Instagram at Girlfriends and Goals podcast. Um, to share your thoughts on this topic. And if you haven't subscribed already, please go ahead and do that now. And don't forget to rate, review, and share. Until next time, bye. Bye.